So we're going to get started, and this morning we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about probability and introduction to Bayes networks, which is another topic um, of interest for artificial intelligence, and it's kind of an interesting topic, so you might enjoy this lecture. I'm not going to review everything there is about probability and statistics, but I'm going to introduce the concepts to you and how it works with networking and how it's applied towards artificial intelligence. So probability. Um, when people think about statistics, that's probably the easiest and the most applicable um, concept, the ability to create probabilities or, you know, expectations, um, I don't know, like uh, projections, maybe is a better word for it, on what something is going to be or how something is going to act. So the world is a very uncertain place, so and sometimes it takes... Basically, at a certain point, you're going to have to basically figure out if there's no facts around. You have to make up your own facts. And the way you make up your own facts in some cases is to come up with a probability. So we're going to assume that we can see the world, and it's really there. But the world has uh, predictable outcomes as well. And so artificial intelligence people like try to expect or try to create uh, visions of reality or visions of truth without actually um, knowing them. So we have some limitations that we encounter when we start looking at problem solutions. And so it makes sense to apply some probabilities to the solutions of problems so that we can better generate more reasonable answers when we don't have facts, we don't have information. So here in a search algorithm that we've uh, explored so far in some other examples, um, well, you know, think of Wampus world, think of the uh, vacuum cleaner world, think of agent solutions, where you got from A to B or... A to C, and you have different choices that you can go in different directions. So we're going to assume that there's a deterministic relationship between the moves and the successors. So if we move A up, it is going to be equal to B. When we move A down, as an example, we're going to go to C. That's good when we know the information, but when we don't know the information and we're not quite sure which one is the correct move, then it makes more sense to apply a statistical theory to it um, so that we can generate better outcomes. And so our limitations that we've encountered, if we take this example, for, for instance, we have like a 50% chance we're going to go to B, or 50% chance maybe that we're going to go to C. Lots of problems aren't really this way. We might have three or four different options. One option might be better for some odd reason or for some unknown reason. And if there's an unknown reason, we can apply uncertainty to it. And if we apply uncertainty to it, we can basically look in the area of probability. And then we can, you know, essentially have better conclusions. So now we have a, an A to B or an A to C that's based on uh, what we see here. So we have, there's a 30% chance we're going to go to A and a 30% we're going to go to B and a 40% chance we might go to C. And so we can put percentages or s basic probabilities on certain nodes. And then we can actually, you know, see which path is the more likely successful path. So moreover, lots of times we don't know exactly where we're going to go in the search, but we can take a look and do some calculations. So basically this particular area has, um, in artificial intelligence, has to do with taking and creating better search paths using probability um, so that we can essentially have a better likelihood of finding the proper solution. So how to cope with a particular problem, we have to integrate or incorporate probability into our graphs and to help us reason and make good decisions sometimes. So it might require a review of uh, some probability basics, which is what we're looking at right now. <clears throat> so we have a Boolean random variable that we can put into the scene. And it's a variable um, that is a variable that can be true or false. So we know about Booleans. So we basically make a true or a false. And then we can actually kind of determine paths by going all the true routes. And if something is wrong, we don't take that route. So a, in particular case, might be the, the president is liberal. B, you woke up tomorrow with a headache. Or A, you have the flu. Or A, you have woke up with a headache. So basically you're saying something is true or false, which is how we would, yesterday when we were looking at expert systems, we were only really concerned with, excuse me, with the Boolean trues or false. So when you design an expert system, you go, if this is true, if this is true, if this is true, and you're looking for the false and the Boolean character, the Boolean value, determines the flow that you're going through the problem solution, which differentiates a lot of expert systems with network systems. So in a traditional network system, you're looking for connections between point A and point B. 
On a Bayes or a statistically or a probability kind of network, we're looking at likelihood. We have the connections, but we want to know, well, which one is more likely to exist or which one is a better, has a better percentage of, of goodness or whatever it happens to be that we're measuring. So if we visualize the solution, so we visualize the probability of A, and our probabilities here in this particular example are listed here, we can say, well, A could be this, A could be this, or A could be this. So the probability, so we can call the probability of A as the, the fraction of possible worlds in which A might be true. And then you can visualize it and put it out into a graph. And then you can actually see, well, if I took 100% and I divided it out over three options, am I going to divide it evenly? Am I going to put more weight on one option versus another option? And so we can better predict which path is the more likely to lead us to the better solution. So an example here, the world in which A is false, and then we have the world in which A is true. So we cross the world in which A is true over the world in which where it's false. So this is what's referred to as the event space of the possible worlds that might exist, because there's always a possibility that A is going to be true. So this area is one, as an example, or is one example of a world space. And so the area here, this reddish oval, is the small portion of A that could possibly be true. So what we're trying to do is put a, uh, you know, put a, put a marking on it or put an indication so that we can use that information to make a better informed search, a search for a better answer. So the axioms of probability exist in which 0 is less than or equal to the probability which is less than or equal to 1. And P is true, which would be equal to 1, and P being false, which would be equal, the probability of it being A being false is also equal to 0. So we have a scale between 0 and 1, and we apply something on the scale to say that, well, the, the probability of that being true is going to be 0 0.5, which is kind of 50-50, actually, um, on a probability. So probability of A or B can be considered, or A and B. And if we do A or B or A and B, then we can direct paths so that we can pick the highest probability with an informed search or with an informed, um, you know, world representation. So we can visualize each one of these axioms in turn. And if we visualize them, they sort of look like this. So visualizing the axiom where 0 is less than or equal to the probability of A, which is less than or equal to 1. So it's going to be between 0 and 1 somewhere where it's true, a full true is going to be a zero, excuse me, a full true is going to be a one, or a full, full false is going to be a zero. We can take a look at this and we can say, well, here, here is the probability right here. So we can actually graph this out if we wanted to and visually see where does this fall in on the axis so that the area of A can't get any smaller than zero. And the zero area uh, would mean that no world could ever have an A being true. Um, so that's probably not going to be a highly likely, you know, kind of event, unless A was not correct and A was false. So here we have the uh, the opposite. This is the this is the smallest possibility. Then we also have the opposite here, where it's one. So the area can't get any bigger than one, and so one fills up the area. And so then the area of one means everything is true. This is kind of the this one here would be the the false representation where we see a scatter or we see a one small little point. So we can use this to visually kind of predict the possibility of our hypothesis actually being correct. So we can use a forward or backward chaining kind of technique with non-true false, you know, with, well, it's kind of true or nah, it's kind of false kind of reasoning. Um, which is a completely different theory than expert systems. Expert systems, it's true or it's false. There's no probability in there usually. But we can add probability as a concept if we wanted to. But your traditional style expert system isn't really taking or may not necessarily take statistics into consideration. It's dealing with the concepts of uh, there being an exact zero or one. So if we take a look at it and we mix it, um, so we've seen the, you know, the both extremes. If we mix a little bit, we have uh, where P, where probability of A or B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A and B. So it's the exact opposite. And so we can kind of see where they intersect, where they all overlap. And then we go, well, if, if all of these things have something to do with the solution, then if it's this one or this one, we can make better groupings. 
so that we can reduce down the search space so the world space gets smaller because we don't consider things that aren't in the intersection of all of these different A's and B's and C's and stuff. And here's the exact opposite of the intersections where they don't collide. So we're looking at here the A or the B. So simple addition and subtraction can kind of give us the, the, the cross or can give us the uh, groupings. So here's A or B where A plus B and A, you know, minus probability of A and B. So if we add one or the other in and get rid of the, uh, the cross between both of them together, we get the outside. We get the opposite. So this is A or B, and this is A and B, which means this area in the middle here is what we're really concerned with if we want to get the intersection of all of it. And if we want that, then we can know we have positively hit on something. It's going to be one of these three, or one of these two is going to be the solution. So the theorems of the axiom here um, can also be written out uh, mathematically, or you know, actually it's kind of uh, statistically, if we can, and through proofs actually. So we can say if the probability of this is true and the probability of that is false, then if this or that is true, cross it so that this and this minus this or that, or this and this minus this and that, is going to give us what essentially we're looking for. So from here we can prove P but not A. So the probability of it not being A. If the probability of it not being A is higher than the probability of it not being B, then we know it's not A. Then we can basically reduce the problem space even further. Or, you know, it's roughly equivalent, probability is roughly equivalent to A, which is going to be equal to 1 minus probability of A. It's going to give us our opposite. So, so we have conditional probability. So we can say A given B, B given A in terms of conditions. So the fraction of the world in which B is true and also have A true, so B and A. So H might be you have a headache and F might be coming down with a flu. So most people who have a headache could be, there's a cross between those people who have both conditions of H and F. So you can say that the probability of the headache is uh, 1 over 10 and the probability of coming down with a flu is 1 over 40. And if you have both, it's 50-50 actually at this point, it's 1 half. So the headaches are rare, and the, the flu is even rarer. So, but if you're coming down with the flu, there's a 50-50 chance you're going to have a headache, according to this reasoning. If, if the entire world existed of only people with headaches and flus, and we crossed it like this, we could say that if you have a headache, you might actually have the flu, but we don't know for sure. It's 50-50 given the probabilities. So we cross the probabilities. We come out with the results. And then we can use that information to get the cross-section of different groups. So this is actually pretty good with data mining. It's really good with um, networks, which is what we're going to apply it to in a few minutes here. And um, not necessarily the true-false that's associated with an expert system, but you can actually improve the quality of an expert system by applying this logic as well. So another example of conditional probability using the probability of a headache and the flu is the fraction of the flu-infected world in which you have a headache, which is going to be equal to the number of worlds with flu and headache divided by the number of worlds with just the flu, which is basically how you're going to get out, you know, a regular old percentage. What percentage of the population has both versus just one? Which would equal the area of the headache and the flu region divided by the region or the area of the flu region, uh, which is going to be this particular case in, in what you're looking at in a particular diagram. So going through the same statistics again, you can show the conditional probability to um, visually sometimes, but also statistically, give you the answers to likelihoods or coincidences that might occur when you don't know, when there is no direct answer to it. So the definitions of condi conditional probability here can be written out as well. And you can also apply a chain rule to it. When you start applying a chain rule to it, then you can deduce different probabilities from existing probabilities, given different likely, likelihoods of certain events occurring, which is how they can predict some things like, for example, if we have a shift in weather, and we have precipitation, and we have this, and we have that, you know. In fact, they always give it to you in a percentage. It says, you know, 20%, 30%. Out of 100, which means on a scale, and you add that with another 
quality that leads to rain, you know, maybe humidity or something. Um, then you can pretty much predict what's going to happen using the probability of known statistics in terms of those ratios. Also, you know, when they say, oh, this is earthquake weather. Well, how do you know it's earthquake weather? Well, they give the probability of the weather shift along with the probability of the timing of the year along with the, along with the um, what percentage of earthquakes have happened in this month versus that month given when was the last recent earthquake. All this information can be put in there and they can say, well, there's a 50-50 chance or there's a 20% chance. And then you can use that probability to determine if it's under 50, but probably the answer is no. And if it's over 50, then probably the answer is yes. So when you look at weather reports and you see that there's a 40% precipitation or 50%, it's going to rain. <laughs> you see a 20% or a 30%, probably not going to rain. But they're telling you that there's a chance that it might rain. But we don't really know exactly. And most likely it's not going to rain, but we have to tell you it's partly cloudy. So how those pictures change between partly cloudy and cloudy and really cloudy and raining is with the probability calculation that's being performed with precipitation as one of the main components, but there's also other factors that play a part. So reasoning with um, conditional probability is how it applies towards artificial intelligence. And uh, what we have here is uh, H has, uh, has a headache and uh, F is coming down with the flu. And one day you wake up with a headache and you think, man, I think, you know, what's going to happen, right? So 50% of the flu cases are associated with people with headaches. And if you have a headache, you have a 50-50 chance you're coming down with the flu. Is that really good reasoning? No, because you're only considering the flu. What if you have um, eye ache or eye strain or something of that nature, which is not headache related or not flu related, but it's headache related? So you're only looking at part of the picture, which then also poses another challenge. Can you guys wait with the attendance until after the break? Because it's too distracting. After the break, after the lecture, you can do the attendance. If you came in late, don't rush over to the TA for attendance. We'll do it when I break. OK, so what we just did more formally is actually part of the Bayes, uh, Bayes rule. So more formally, we can actually put it together and use this in terms of the of the theory that this guy came up with. So Bayes Thomas, he wrote an essay towards solving a problem with a doctrine of chances. And it's all about chance theory. And uh, this is back in the 1763s. And he's one of the people who contributed a lot to the body of statistics is where most of the probability theory, the mean, the error, all that stuff sort of came out of predecessor theory related to conditional probabilities. So using Bayes' rule, we can also apply it to gambling. And uh, we, I went through this the other day, uh, but it was probably during the first interactive session where we looked at the role of dice. And uh, the concept of chance versus concept of probability. And uh, if you take the statistical chances and the probabilities that are associated with certain combinations of the dice roll, um, there are document. well, you can actually just go online and find the documentation, but you can actually calculate yourself the likelihood of a 7 being rolled over a 1 versus a 12 versus a 4 versus a 5. And you can see that the combinations come out statistically for certain numbers have a higher likelihood. So the concept of chance games and game theory play a role in this in terms of the, you know, the, the game of craps, the game of 21. Um, all of these sort of um, chance games really aren't associated with chance at some point. In fact, that the chance actually gets worse when they start introducing different environments. So the environment that is associated with a card game would be the deck. And so if they put in three or four decks, well, your environment makes it statistically off, so you can't calculate. Or if, for example, they keep you know, changing the dice or changing the player who's rolling the dice or changing some pattern in the existence of something that's a factor of the environment, then you're making it less likely that you're going to be able to predict, which makes it more of a chance game. So anyway, they refer to most of these dice games as chance, but statistically they're not. There's a way that those dice are going to roll. There's a way that those cards are going to come out. Uh, so that's why people get arrested for card counting and people get arrested for, I don't know, putting in fake dice that only roll a certain way or that are weighted a certain way. 
So you can use uh, Bayes' rules uh, to gamble. Here's a, you know, here's a kind of an, an example as well. So the win envelope has a dollar and four, uh, four beads in it, and the lose envelope has three beads and no money. So you want to pick the right envelope. You know, you put an envelope in two different hands. Actually, that's kind of funny because if you have two hands, you know, play as kids. You know, you put a penny in one of the or a quarter or something like that, and you turn the hands upside down. Hey, pick it on, pick it on. Well, you got a 50-50 chance. Most people learn that when they're a kid. Because 50% of the chance times you're going to win it, 50% you're not going to win it. Uh, so it's kind of around the same kind of concept. You're going to pick one of these two. So a trivial question might be someone picks an envelope at random and then asks you to bet as to whether or not it's holding the dollar. And what are your odds? So you'd actually have to calculate that out. You have to go, well, a not, a trivial, not a trivial question might be someone lets you take the beads out of one of the envelopes before you bet. So you have three of them in here and there's no money and you have four of them in here and you do have money. Well if you pull the beads out you know if you've got money or not. So you can leverage your bet with the information that you've received so far. So if it's black then you have uh, then what are your odds? If it's red then what are your odds? If you pull out a, you know, for example you can take one bead out. I'm going to change the scenario a little bit here. If you can pull a bead out, and there's more black beads than there are red beads, because there are actually, there's only three red beads and there's four black beads total. So if you pull the random, um, you had these two envelopes, and you're trying to guess which one has the money in it, and you're allowed to pull information out of the envelopes, and you pull a black bead out of one envelope, there's a chance that you probably have the one without the money, actually, because got a higher likelihood chance of pulling a red one out if you've got the one with the money because there's two red beads in there. So if you pull the red bead out, I'd be more likely to think, statistically, I have the envelope with the money in it because I pulled that red bead out. But your odds are still pretty low. If you pulled two beads out and those two beads were both red, you won because you know you got the envelope with the two red beads in it. So you can solve AI problems using the same theory. You can actually create games that are kind of going off of the same type of logic. What is this involved? Well, figuring out the probability statistically with the information that you have and taking that information and using it to make a better decision. As an example, if I walk outside and I see clouds in the sky, I'm probably going to think it's going to rain, but if I don't see the clouds, which is kind of tricky, but you look at the weather report, and the weather report says it's going to rain, but you don't see clouds in there, then your likelihood, your, 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 your percent of confidence of taking the umbrella is a little bit lower, which is kind of the same, same concept with the beads and the colors. So if it's black, what are your odds? If it's red, what are your odds? Well, you can calculate that out. Actually, you can do a joint distribution kind of table here as well. Um, so you have the probabilities, and this is a kind of an example of a probability distribution that you could put together, where you have the Boolean variables A, B, and C as an example, and this is a different scenario. So a joint distribution records the probabilities that multiple variables will hold particular values, and then they are represented much like a truth tables. So truth tables come into theory here. So A is 0, B is 0, C is 0, then the probability is going to be 30%. If A is 0, B is 0, and one, C is 1, then you're looking at 0 0.05. So you're going down a little bit further. So the population, so, so they are populated using expert knowledge or by using axioms of probability or by actual data that can be populated. So and also noting that the sum of the probabilities must be equal to 1. If the sum's not equal to 1, you're going to end up with an uh, imbalanced scale because at the end of the day, something's going to not influence correctly at the right percentage. So the, all of the probabilities should equal to 1 um, in order to satisfy the axioms of probability. So all of these numbers in here, all of the overlaps should be equal to 1 at the end of the day. <coughs> if it's not, you're definitely not balanced. So you can take the combination of A, B, and C in this particular case and figure out that th you have a 30 percent, um, you know, given the uh, information, actually. But it doesn't actually calculate. Um, according to the slide, the, the slide's actually not showing that. So. so you can also use the joint. So you can use the joint distributions, and then you can use the tables 
to kind of figure out, well, if you have this joint distribution, you can ask the probability of any of the logical expressions involving any of your attributes. So if you take, going back to the weather example, all of the different factors and you add it up, you can mathematically calculate the probability of it raining by the number that you're coming out with. That's the equal to the sum of all of the sub-probabilities that you're going to add up with the cross groups. So you're going to essentially get this, this kind of cross between precipitation, between cloud coverage, between weather patterns, between the month of the year, did it rain yesterday, did it rain tomorrow? And if you get the cross-section of all of this stuff and it's above a certain percentage, then you know there's going to be a 50% chance of rain. So most likely, if you're going to see it that high, it's going to rain. So. so note that these probabilities are part of the UCI adult census. So they come from a statistic, um, st some known statistical analysis that's been done on census material. So what people actually do um, is take census data so you're an AI professional and you're trying to come out with, where should I put the next Starbucks or something? So you're going to statistically take, for example, the uh, cost of living in a particular area. Maybe you're going to take also the average income in a particular area. And you're going to take maybe ethnic groups. You're going to take something age or something. And go, well, uh, you know, in the city of San Jose, the population is this. There's certain people over this age. They're all single owner homes or something. And all this information, you're going to put it in there. And then you're going to say, San Jose is 40%, but Palo Alto is 90%. Oh, I need to go to Palo Alto. So you look for the highest probability statistic that you're going to have success given all the factors that you're putting into it, uh, which is how people make decisions, actually, with expert systems as well in some of the higher-end um, decision-making. So here's using the joint as well. Um, you're looking for poor males in this particular information and looking at male and female incomes at certain areas. We have the rich, the poor kind of divided out in terms of their ratios. It doesn't really matter what the data is showing. But we can see that we've got, uh, for a male to be poor, given this population, it's going to be a, you know, yeah, about 47% likelihood given the statistics that we're actually you know, evaluating in here. So this is hours worked with wealth by gender. The theory is the more hours you work, the gender, excuse me, the more hours you work, the wealth goes up, essentially. And then using the, the, the uh, joint distribution as well, you can see that the probability of it being poor is 0.76. The prob probability of the being male is 0.46. So it's a higher percentage here if it's going to be poor. And then you can do the inference. So the inference with the joint would basically take the ratio and say, well, if you're male and you work so many hours, then the probability is going to be male and poor. You're about 61% in your 61% group, which is how they do for medical diagnostics for um, certain conditions. So I'm going back to the medical triage kind of example I was giving you yesterday. You walk in, you have a high temperature, you have high blood pressure, you've got a pain in your stomach, and you ate at Mr. Chow's. Uh, that might come back. The system might actually come back and say, "Well, you know what? There's probably a highly likelihood, if you weren't using an expert system and you were designing a neural or a, um, a weighted system or a Bayes network to do this with, you plug in all the calculations and you let you know you let the graph kind of go down because we're looking at a network now instead of if and thens. So you take all these probabilities and all these things that you have, probabilities that are associated with things that you have. So you got if a we got A to B to C, but it's not a really an if because we don't know. You say, well, that's why you get the scale. So on a t scale of 1 to 10, how, ha how hard is, you know, how painful does your stomach hurt? And it's, so you, get, you give it a 6. Well, most likely that's going to be associated with a statistic of a percentage of pain versus, and how likelihood is your arm going to hurt? Nothing, no, nothing, zero, my arm doesn't hurt. So then you can kind of statistically calculate out areas, body areas, and also pain levels and intensities and stuff. So where we are, we have been uh, looking at inferences so far in some of the inference engines of expert systems yesterday. So let's say, for example, we've got a sore neck, and how likely am I to have the flu if I have a sore neck? Well, actually, there is a likelihood. So the polls for, let's say, for liberal presidents you know, ahead of by five points, how likely is he or she to win the election? Well, it's only five points. 
which is kind of interesting because people were predicting, and they were wrong. They were bad predictions during the last election, actually. They were going, oh, he's ahead by so And then an hour later, oh, sorry, wrong. <laughs> it's the opposite, you know. <laughs> and it kind of just changes over a few minutes because, oh, they see the trend, and they, all of a sudden they look at that and go, oh, no, no, that guy's not going to win. So-and-so won. But, you know, the guy doesn't actually win for another couple weeks because... It's not over yet. They haven't counted all the votes yet, but they can statistically calculate it and say, uh, he won, she won. It's kind of like you in a class. You know, you can probably figure out by the stuff you're turning in and stuff like that, the probability of you getting a good grade in the class is probably going to be based upon the work you're doing. So you can kind of figure that out and know ahead of time before you even get a grade, what the, what the grade's supposed to be. And that's when people go, wait a minute, that's the wrong grade. So a person is reading an email about guitars. How likely is that person going to buy a guitar pick? Hmm, probably pretty likely. So web, web companies obviously use this information, and they call it data mining, actually, because what they're doing is they're looking at the information, and they're t letting the information tell them what to sell to this person instead of doing it the opposite. Instead of saying, let me find all the people I can possibly sell a guitar pick to, and then guitar picks a like maybe a penny. It doesn't really have a high cost to it. It's a really low selling item. So you're not going to spend too much time with this problem in the real world. But if you wanted to find, let's say, I want to sell these people color TVs. Well, who are the people that are watching the game? So or who are the people that watch sports events? Or who are the people that buy tickets for something? And then you can go, well, these people are going to want TVs. Or these people, you know, who are the students? So these people are going to want computers. So you can kind of use the demographic of the information and what it's telling you to figure out the probability that this person or this group is likely to purchase something. So then they take the cross sections and then they can figure out, well, what color should we make the item? Well, because these people are conservative and they live in the state of California and they like to buy expensive cars and it's really hot in California, so let's sell them all gray cars, which is actually going on. I mean, it has been going on for years. The most popular color of a car in California is the color gray because these people are conservative. <laughs> yeah, and long story short, gray is a very popular color for everything, uh, which is kind of interesting because they, Apple makes the gray, you know, the kind of kind of gray color computer. Well, they're more conservative. They're business-like. They're not fun versus the white. But, you know, you can make it fun by putting a cover on it. But, you know, long story short, there's... People make decisions on patterns, decisions based on patterns and probabilities. So you can, preterm, you know, you're trying to put a product out and it's an iPad, I mean, it's an iPod or something. And what do people want? Well, you kind of look statistically and you can figure out the probability of the product actually selling well, given all of the different factors that might go into it. You know, like you have earthquakes, right? And uh, let's say, for example, Tons of earthquakes and it's been raining. Well, most likely you're probably going to want to sell umbrellas. You know, you're probably going to want to sell uh, water because you people are going to want to, you know, earthquakes. Oh, no, they're going to have, you know, one of those a disaster preparedness kits and um, flashlights and batteries and all this stuff. So you can kind of predict, you know. It's kind of like the no-brainer. It's the holiday season. So what do you do? You stock up on everything because people are going to come in buying crap, you know, because it's the holiday season. So, um Anyway, so this is a big deal. As an inference is, um, it's the core of a lot of industries, uh, which is why I'm spending some time kind of just making note of this. So predicting polls, stock market, optimizing ad placements can potentially earn money, hopefully. Um, also predicting flu outbreaks, moreover, you know, helping the world. Because after all, money is not everything, hopefully. So, But statistics, actually, this kind of area of Bayes Networks is used every single Every single company wants to make money normally, so they're going to want something. They're going to use some theory. So we have some independence as well. So census data is represented, uh, represented as vectors of variables and occurrences of values that are seen in, for certain probability things. And it's unrelated and it's independent data. So what people are doing now with data mining is actually taking independent data that was collected for something. It's there. Like maybe it's out on the internet. And then it's determining whether you should hire this person, or it's determining whether you should fire this person, or it's determining how much should this person make because of this data that exists. So it's making decisions, which is kind of like a lot of people are kind of afraid because 
don't put something out on the internet that you don't want to be used against you or you want to be used in the wrong context. Because once you stick data out there, there's no dependence between your Facebook stuff, your pictures and stuff. And another app that goes by and data mines the pictures and figures out statistically how many people have visited this place and who are these people that are visiting this place. And, you know, we need to sell them something or we need to market towards them a certain way because they like to go to this place because look, there's a logo in the back of that picture that shows something, then you statistically got categorized as being a patron of some place or something. You, know, you like to go to you like to go to Chow's Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so because you got a picture you know, all your pictures show Chow's logo in the background or something. Or you're standing in the on a street or you're standing in a in a park. Oh, you must like parks. So the demographic is actually created by all sorts of mining, mining pictures, mining data, mining information, text, random text that gets put in there. It's all taken independent of its original use, but it's used statistically, especially with a lot of data mining applications, to figure out what can we sell you, what can we market towards you, and who knows what we'll do with it in the future. So we have census data that's collected by the government, actually, that's freely available that you can purchase. So companies can only purchase and they get access to census data so we know all about you anyway. We know everything you've done. You can go to county records department and get all a much of other data about you. So it's not a coincidence that you receive junk mail about things that you do. As an example, if you're a college student, you'll get more junk mails about student loans. You'll get more junk mail about computer purchases and office supplies and all sorts of stuff because they're using that demographic against you or for you if you think of it positively. Uh, so we say that the variables like gender, hours of work, um, hours worked per week um, are independent if and only if the probability of the hours worked by gender is equal to the hours worked and also the probability of gender as an example and hours worked is equal to probability of the gender. So we can say if we have an equivalent and so we can add it up as going to be equal to a whole or a one or 100, we can say that the sum of the parts, so we can break the parts out and then we can mix the parts around. And if we mix the parts around, then we can get some interesting conclusions out of this and we can figure out who works more hours, male or female, who buys more coffee, male or female, who, you know, um, who do, and then we can figure out, well, who are we going to sell to and then who's our target market, so. And more generally, we can assume that A and B are Boolean random variables. Then uh, A and B are independent if and only if there's a relationship the probability of A or B. And then we know that they're independent if we have the or in there. So we have the probability of A or the probability of B in terms of um, their independence. So A and B are independent if it's noted as, and this is just the notation. Don't worry about the notation and don't worry about the documentation or the marking. It's the theory I'm giving you today. You don't have to put this on any midterm or any final exam or anything of that nature. Um, and you're probably already familiar with most of the statistical notation if you've taken a class in statistics. This is classical statistics as it applies towards artificial intelligence. We also have conditional independence. And so we have a graphic picture here showing us the conditional independence where these pictures are representing the probabilities of the event that A, B, and C, which are the areas shaded in red, blue, and yellow, respectively, with uh, respect to the total area. So in both examples, A and B are conditionally independent given C, you know, because of the, of the way that it's distributed in terms of its or, and, uh, but A and B are not conditionally dependent given the likelihood of C or the, you know, the average of C in terms of the occurrences. So we can kind of see the independence actually by looking at the color combinations and C is the, C is the uh, yellow respectively. And so we can see if C is in there, C is kind of independent, but if we define C then we can get the ratios of A, B and, C, a and B that are part of it. So. So the value of independence can actually be represented as well. So we complete independence reduces from representation to joint and inferences, and it actually leads to some sort of um, calculation that we can make for efficiency. Um, so what we want to do is sort of take in consideration how to make, because we're looking at the concept of networking, and we're looking at the concept of building trees, how do we make it efficient by looking at you know, only probabilities that make sense 
in terms of the likelihood. So unfortunately, and it can be time consuming actually if you're going to calculate all of it and do all of the inferences. So complete mutual independence is very rare actually with a lot of statistics. So most uh, realistic domains do not exhibit this property. As an example, the independence of people buying particular brands of coffee. We're not going to have a case in which only males buy Pete's coffee and only females buy Starbucks coffee or something or vice versa. Um, that independence isn't going to exist probably. And only certain products and certain services are going to be used by, let's say, if we're taking the two genders as the two statistical groups, we're not going to get independence and we're not going to get mutual you know, any mutual exclusion going on anywhere, seriously, unless we're looking at a very specific product. In that particular case, there's no artificial intelligence needed. We already know that. So, so something for, uh, you know, I mean, you can just think of products yourself, actually. Um, so, unfortunately, the complete mutual independence is very rare. So, fortunately, most domains do exhibit a fair amount of conditional independence, so we can find connections between certain things. And we can exploit conditional independence for representation and inference as well. That would be, for the example, most people, if you were looking at the number of hours worked, most people who work more hours, that particular group is going to drink more coffee, probably, statistically. So the people that don't work, or the unemployed people, aren't going to drink as much coffee, statistically. It might be money-related, might be unemployment-related, might be that they don't have to be awake 24 hours a day to work 24 hours a day or something of that nature. So that's what it's basically looking at in terms of the cross between the groups. So Bayes Networks does this for us, which is why we're looking at statistics today. It exploits conditional independence. So if one condition is relying on another condition, we can find out if it's independent, we can find out if there's a dependence on the relationship, and we can connect the dots to see that, for example, What's the average age of, you know, we can take the average age of people who buy coffee, and we can take the average income of those people. We can take how many hours they're working, and we can take, you know, how many hours of sleep do they get. And we can figure out how much to price the coffee at, as an example, uh, which is what the networking solution is actually used for. So an artificial intelligence solution that statistically based rather than, or probability based, excuse me, rather than um, using other theories of connections. So let's see the conditional independence. What, it, what is a bias considering the story here? If Craig woke up too early, so E is false, and Craig probably needs coffee, which is C. If Craig needs coffee, he's likely angry, you know, because people who wake up early who need coffee and don't get their coffee, they're not usually in good shape. And if he's angry, then he has an increased chance of bursting a brain vessel, <laughs> you know, if he's seriously which is B for brain vessel. If he hurts his brain vessel, he's likely to be in the hospital, H. So you have, you have to say, well then, if he wakes up, what is the likelihood, if Craig wakes up too early in the morning, what's the likelihood he's, he's going to be in the hospital? Well, you have to find all the different connections between all the different paths between E and H to kind of figure out, well, it is possible. If I wake up too early, I might be in the hospital if I burst a brain vessel if I don't get my coffee and I get too angry. So. so E is uh, Craig woke up too early, A is, is angry. So one leads to another, which leads to another. So we don't necessarily have to wake up early to be angry, however. So if a student bothers Barbara and Barbara has a headache <laughs> and Barbara drinks too much coffee <laughs> or something, what's the likelihood of her being in the hospital? You, know, you can, you can kind of just kind of figure out, in fact, people do this. And then they, it's actually what you do when you figure out, well, I want to buy a car. If I buy this car here, it's going to be a nice status symbol or something. But I'm not going to have enough money to buy food. Or I'm not going to, you know, so you kind of weigh this. And then this is going to lead to this. And this is going to lead to this. And then eventually the bank's going to repossess my car. So then you go, okay, don't buy that car. Because you don't like the outcome that could possibly happen. So Craig just should not wake up early because then he can avoid the likelihood of him being in the hospital by just not waking up early. And people use that theory, actually. In fact, a lot of students use that theory, well, American students, they go, well, I'm not going to go to college. And you go, oh, I have, that's a dumb decision. Why did you say it? If I go to college, I'm going to have student loans. And if I have student loans, then it's going to take me too long to 
pay off the student loan. So my the amount of extra income I'm going to make is not going to. I'm just going to break even on that. And then if I go to college, I'm not going to get married until I get out of college. And then if I wait that long, my kids are going to be old when young when I'm old, and I'm not going to be able to play with my kids. So I'm not going to college because I'm going to throw my arm out too early in life, and I'm not going to be able to play baseball for my with my kid later or something. And you're like, well, how did you deduce that? Well. They're probably using some sort of a scenario similar to Craig and his coffee to deduce this, this, this probability of this happening with the connections that are being made. So now what data mining does is it takes and creates artificial connections. So you can take all the data out there and put the connections together using a Bayes network or some similar approach. And then statistically figure out that everyone who lives in California um, on average spends more money on certain consumer goods and has more disposable income or something or does this or does that or people like the color silver. Conservative people like the color silver actually, which is true. And how you can say that? How, you know, how can you say, well, because statistically this, 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 and this. So, which is why if you're going to make cars and sell them in California, a good percentage of them are going to be silver. You know what people don't like in California is colors. They don't buy colored cars, which is kind of interesting because recently we have more colored cars in California because colored cars are less serious and people in California don't want to be as serious anymore. <laughs> so, which statistically actually is kind of proven. So, and you, how do you find out all this stuff? You, you listen to like Channel 9, Discovery Channel and stuff, and they go through these things, you know, they, they watch ants. There's a thing called ant theory, actually, where if for example, in this room right now, if someone were to collapse, you know, fall down, statistically, likelihood that person's probably going to die before it makes it to the hospital because this is ant theory. There's too many of us. None of us are going to come out and save that person or even offer to help. You know, one of you guys is going to croak. And you're just going to fall over. And everyone is going to go ignore you and just like not. But if you were only two people in the room, one person fell over, the higher likelihood that that person is going to survive. The fewer number of people around, the higher likelihood that person is going to survive because the person is going to get help immediately. Because that one person in the room is going to feel obligated to help the person. So if you have a lot of people that like something, so you can take this whole theory and go towards the president, for example, in the election. If you get enough people to like them, all the people will like them. <laughs> because they'll go in a group. They won't stray from the group. So, but if only a couple people, they're oddballs. They're, you know, everybody likes them, right? So everybody will vote the same way. And the numbers will go higher, which is what you know presidents do. They go around, hey, everybody likes me, right? And they make everyone like them because the more people they can get, the more other people who are wishy-washy will go one direction. Oh, everyone's voting for him. Everyone's taking that route. I'm going to take that route too. And it's follower theory. So there's a ton of theories that go into play that people use for statistics to analyze human behavior. You can take that. And this is crossover where AI crosses over with psychology as well. Take that and apply it towards what product am I going to release next year? Or how many of these products should I make? Or, you know, given certain... Then you can pre pretty much use it for business and you can use it for, you know, artificial intelligence purposes. So. So conditional independence, to continue with our story here, if we know that E, C, and A, and B are ass assessments of the probability of Craig going into the hospital, and we know if anything changed, that might change the assessment. So as an example, if any of these are seen to be true, he would increase the likelihood of going into the hospital and decrease his not likelihood, so the opposite of him going in. So this means that H is not independent. So if H is affected by all these other events, it's not, it's dependent. It's not in, independent in terms of the likelihood. Uh, so it means it's not independent. And if we knew that B uh, would be in good shape if evaluated in the hospital, then we would know that um, the values of E, C, and A, um, they're, they're not associated. So we, we would not necessarily know the values. So it might influence a factor that on H that is mediated by B. So... So we not necessarily know because he came into the hospital and that he was evaluated in good shape. We might not know that he had a headache or we might not know that he woke up early or that he didn't get his coffee on time and he got angry. So 
which is kind of interesting as well. So Craig doesn't get sent to the hospital because he's angry. He gets sent to the hospital because he had an aneurysm. So the conditional kind of um, theory of the connection is independent or could be seen as independent. So, so H is independent of E, C, and A given B. So we can say which one, we can see and look at the dependencies between the connections and predict outcomes. We can work it backwards, going back to the concept of forward and backward chaining. From the, from the hospital, we're not going to deduce that he actually woke up early. We're just going to know that maybe he was angry, but we're probably not going to know that either. At the hospital, we're going to know that he had an aneurysm. Well, he had an aneurysm because he broke a blood vessel because he got angry. But we don't know that. We don't care about that. But if there's a correlation there, then that's when the doctor would say, have you been angry? <laughs> you know? And then the person would ask, answer the question. So you can use this theory with expert systems to generate responses to train the system. And then you keep the response in there. And then you pull through the database all the people that have been angry in this particular case. And then you can do this, well, a good percentage of these people that are angry have brain aneurysms. Oh. It's just like what they're trying to do with cancer. You know, a good percentage of people that drink diet sodas end up with cancer. So there must be a connection, right? And then they recently found out there is no connection. So, or a group of people find out, you know, there is. Another group says there's not. And so it depends on which data you're using in terms of the interdependence and the dependencies. So in a similar particular case here, we can rule out or we can give probabilities of each one of the events independently. So B is independent of E and C given A, and A is independent of E given C, which means that the probabilities are not associated. So the subset of the relation might hold, subset might not hold. So, so also, you know, keeping this in mind by the chain rule for an instantiation of H from E, giving it back, we can kind of statistically proportion it and then we can create um, our independence assumptions from this and our dependence assumptions. And then we can specify the full joint of the, specifying the five local conditional distributions and put it all together to basically build a network out of this so we can connect the dots and figure out if something is true or false or something is going to happen or not happen. So here's an example quantification. It's referred to as quantification because we're quantifying our results to say that Craig had an aneurysm because of the coffee, or Craig had an aneurysm because he, got, he was angry. So we're simplifying the joints that we require for only nine parameters here. So we're, we're taking and we're simplifying out all of the different combinations of all of the different events that have occurred. And we're inferring in a linear kind of fashion in the numbers of the variables instead of exponentially. So we're just going in a, in a straight line. So the inference is a linear is linear generally if it's dependent as a chain structure. So sometimes people actually, there's a slang word that came out of this chain rule, which is a chain reaction. It's kind of like the domino rule. You know, um, chain of events occur, given one, you, know, you got another, you got another, you got another, and it creates a chain, which is kind of like where the theory, where, where that expression actually comes from, is from the chain, Bayes' chain rule, which basically creates a chain of reaction. So just because you failed this exam or something, you're going to fail school because of the chain reaction. Or you failed a class, so you're going to get kicked out of school, so you're going to go broke, and so you're going to rob a bank, and then you're going to be arrested and going to spend the rest of your life in prison. So that would be a chain reaction. Because so now when you're, if you go through the chain, theoretically, it might be true or it might be false given these series of events that occur. So if you go through and say, well, all right, so most people don't do this, but you know, you pull up to a, a light that is yellow, not red, but not green, but yellow, you have to decide, am I going to stop or am I going to go? If you went through the chain system, that might determine whether or not you're going to be able to walk again, or that might determine whether or not you're going to die, or that might determine. So you have to go through all of the different outcomes that might occur. Your biggest outcome is, am I going to be late for work? <laughs> if you're late for work, then you're going to lose your job. If you lose your job, it doesn't in any way outweigh. You say, well, okay, so if I'm late for work, I might lose my job. If I lose my job, then I don't know. I'm going to lose my house. If I lose my house, I'm going to lose my family. If I lose my family, I'm going to be you know, thrown out, and then I'm going to die. And I'm going to eventually live on the street, and then I'm going to be homeless and all these other things. And you're weighing that out versus, okay, so if I wait, I may not lose my job. Or if I go through the thing, then 
if I don't wait, if I wait, I'm going to lose my job. If I go through the light and I get hit, I'm going to die instantly. Or I'm going to hit this kid who just ran out of the street who with a ball, and I'm going to kill that person, and I'm going to end up you know, having to go to court. And What I'm describing is a chain of reactions. You put together a Bayes network. You look at the outcome you want, and you can work it backwards, back from a backward chaining approach to the initial response which is how people decide to go to college sometimes. Sometimes people don't even think about it. They just say, you're going to go to college. OK. And then the kid doesn't know why until later on we go, ah, oh, that's why. Because you have a higher likelihood of getting to this point further down the chain of events at the very end, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. It's better looking <laughs> than if you didn't go. So that's why people make decisions for career paths. I want to be a doctor. Well, you're not going to be a doctor if you study computer science. So you can kind of know you're going to probably be, I want to be a lawyer. Well, you're probably going to want to learn how to write first. So then you can kind of tell for career growth, you can do it this way, you can do it for, are we going to have an earthquake today? Is it going to rain today? Um, am I, should I sell the stock? Should I buy the stock? All these decisions are sort of made through this inference engine that is done through a Bayes network, looking at statistical probability and connections and chain reactions that are going to occur from point A to point B. Um, so these are terms that are specified here for local distributions. Don't worry about the statistical part. You don't have to do anything for any of the assignments or for any of the exams. And I'm not going to go through statistics in this class, but I want to talk about Bayes networks. Now that I just gave you the kind of layman's terms for it, you know, kind of the brief overview of what it is. Let's take a look at it from a graphical presentation and from a networking theory. So the structure we just described is the Bayes network. It's that connection. The BN or Bayes network is a graphical representation of the direct dependencies over a set of variables according to this definition. You take that in consideration together with a set of conditional probability tables quantifying the strengths of the influences, and then you can influence the decision given the strength of the outcome. Meaning, if you went and created a Bayes network for going through the red light, most likely the average person would stop, <laughs> which is what you're supposed to do, because the risk is too high. If you go through that red light, or you, you go through a red light, or if you go through a yellow light, way too high of a risk. But if you saw the light turn yellow, you might go through the lights because then your weights in terms of the probability of the conclusion actually existing if the light just turns yellow that piece of information is going to help you decide I'm going to go through the light because the chance of getting hit not so high anymore so it determines on what input you're looking at is going to influence the output so Bayes networks generally the ideas above here are interesting ways of leading to effective means of representation in inferencing under uncertainty. 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 So we would not use this. So let's go back a couple of minutes here. Yesterday I talked about expert systems. That's used in certain situations. We know that this is what how we what we want to do. We want to bag groceries. Going back to that grocery bagging example, we have three bags and we want to put the stuff in the bags. We're certain that we're going to put the stuff in the bags. There's no doubt there. And we just want to know how we're going to do it. So the expert system tells us how because we're not an expert. We don't know how to bag groceries or we don't know how to build a PCB board or we don't know how to, we're not a trained doctor, but we're helping people who come through a triage to get help to categorize them. So. Expert systems are used for categorizations, for automating um, tedious tasks that would take too long for a human to do, for helping um, you know, untrained people become trained people. Um, expert systems are used in almost every business environment as part of someone's daily work task because it makes you more intelligent. Bayes networks are used for uncertainty. I have no idea what major I should study. I don't know if I should go through that red light or not. I don't know if I should buy this stock or sell this stock. So Bayes Networks gives us the uncertain, gives us almost clear answers to extremely uncertain, unconstrained environments. So we can kind of figure out, well, okay. So here's another example. So let's do a Bayes Network example with different. Uh, so this is a different instructor. So example different instructor. So 
M is Marianne. She uh, leads a tutorial, and S is uh, it is sunny outside. And L is the tutorial leader arrives late. So if it's sunny outside and, and she arrives late, so assume that all the tutorial leaders may arrive late in bad weather. Uh, some leaders may also are likely to be late. Some are also more likely to be late than others. So you can begin to write down all of the known knowledge that, uh, that we are happy about. So we can kind of put this all into terms. And the lateness is not independent of the weather. And it is not independent of the lecture. So some lectures, what we're doing is tracking the data. Saying, well, some lectures show up late. Some lectures show up on time, normally. When it's bad weather, all lectures could possibly be showing up late. So we don't know if it's dependent on a particular lecture or if it's an independent factor. So we already know that there, there's a joint between S and M. S meaning that it's sunny out, and M meaning that this is the instructor that we're talking about, Marianne here. So we can write that down, and then we can in the, particularly come out with true-false cases. So Marianne leaves the tutorial. She's it's you know basically continuing with the example because the conditional independence we have six values for the joint instead of seven because we have conditional uh, independence. So again, the con conditional independence leads to computational savings because we only consider the conditions. If something is not a conditional, it's not conditionally dependent. Excuse me, not conditionally independent. We don't necessarily have to deal with it. So we can weed out the sample size, shorten it down, look at the dependencies, look at the conditions and the independencies, and figure out what it is that we want. So we can possibly predict, and what this is getting to is, you know, the conclusion that we can possibly come to where the teacher's going to be late or the teacher's going to be on time. So actually, you can do this yourself reasonably because you already have an instinct or you have a feeling. If someone is notoriously late, they're going to be late because you already have that kind of feeling. If it's raining outside and everybody, when it's raining outside, everybody's late, you know, you have that conditional dependence going on. If it's raining, if it's sunny outside, that's independent. It's sunny outside, so that's a conditional independence. It's independent of whether or not Marianne's going to be late because, well, we don't know, and she's always on time, or she's always late. But this particular case, she's always late, so... So the question can be expressed in terms of the only need of the above expressions for x, y, and z for all of the true and false that makes sense for the scenario. And we take all the true and false, we calculate out their percentages using a probability, and then we add it up to 1 and make sure it equals to 1. So we have 100% of the instances or the scenarios taken into consideration, which is what we've been looking at so far. We can take that and graphically display it in a Bayes network to come out with more information. So here's the notation for it. We read the absence of the arrows. So between S and M, it means that it would not help in the prediction of M if we knew the value of S. So we all basically what we want to know is what arrows are going to be conditional. So we can read the arrows into L to mean that from into L, but not from or into S or L or M. If we want to know the value of L here, it may help if we know whether or not we're coming from M or S. So we can keep track of which route we took through the network with what percentage. So we add it to a graph kind of structure. And this is actually sort of the graph kind of structure that we're looking at. And this might actually help you with the midterm if you're looking at that graph assignment. It's sort of the connections that are being made between the different steps of the search. So now we suppose that we have these three events occurs. So we're looking at the same thing, but we have to, the, t the tutorial leader arrives late, and the tutorial leader is Marianne, and the tutorial leader's concerns reasoning with Bayes' network. So we know that uh, the particular, you know, this particular person has a higher chance of being late than Marianne, and this particular here has a higher, I'm not going to say the name, Adil something rather, has a higher chance of giving lectures about reasoning with Bayes' networks, and this particular person is giving She's late, but we don't know if she's giving this lecture on Bayes Network. But this other person is giving the lecture on Bayes Network. What kind of independence exists in our graph? A ton of independence. We have conditional independence again. So once we know who the lecturer is, then we have the dependency. 
then whether or not they arrive late doesn't affect whether or not the lecture concerns reasoning of the Bay Network. So let me put this in another term and another example. We have a guy who's teaching an SAP class back there. We have an artificial intelligence class over here. If I know who's teaching which class, then I can take that condition out of the equation because I don't have to figure out who's going to arrive late. All I can do is look over there and go, the SAP guy is here. That means I'm the one arriving late, or vice versa, depending upon the condition that I'm uh, familiar with already. So we take the known information and we follow the leads from the known conditions, and we solve the problem of the independent conditions by the dependencies. And then we can conclude if the particular instructor is late, which is only a two-step process here, because I know that teacher, I know this teacher, we know which classes are. One of us is here and one of us is not here, which is how we, you know, we reason in terms of the connections. So as an example, I felt a hot stove. And this is conditional. This is actually it's called conditional behavior because it comes from conditional connections that we do when learning. You're a kid. You touch something. You see a stove. It's hot. You touch it. You burn your finger. And the condition says, ouch, that hurts. So you see another hot item, a candle, a fire, not a stove, but something totally unrelated. And you see, oh, that feels hot. Your conditional behavior and your conditional, your conditioning has predisposed you to build the condition dependence between the feeling of warmth and the, the, the sight of the flame and, I don't know, the heat, whatever. Something is telling you not to touch it, hopefully. And if you've learned it correctly and you've got the synapses working, this is actually getting into the concept of neural networks. So neural networks are built in artificial intelligence or are different than Bayes networks. Bayes networks are based primarily on probability and likelihood of uncertainty. Neural networks are built with knowledge gained from connections between our neurons, which is how we think, how humans think. So we grow up and we step, we, act, we actually have to do everything. We have to cut our finger, we have to burn ourselves, we have to um, fall on the floor, we have to run, we have, it's because if you don't do it, you don't have the memory of it. If you don't have the memory of it, you can't do it. And you can't do other things because of that, which is why how people get limited in terms of stunting of growth. If you put a child in a room and lock them in a room by themselves without any exposure to humans, they don't have social skills because they haven't learned social skills. Um, if, if they've never touched anything hot, they're going to burn themselves because they don't know better. They don't know not to burn themselves because they don't know the opposite and they can't do the connection. So neural networks takes all this data that we know about the problem and it does our, the connections for us. So it makes the connection between, oh, it's hot. It looks like it's hot. feels like it's hot. It must be hot. Don't touch it. So you're not going to touch that. Instead, you're going to touch the cold item instead. And the synopsis of the neural network would lead to the cold route if the goal was not to get burned. So the probability condition does the same thing, but it does it in using probability. The Bayes network does it using probability versus connections between the data, which is the neural network, which is the next lecture, actually. But so on a conditional end, we can eliminate the independence and throw it out. Look at the dependencies or the conditions that are leading to the dependencies, establish the dependencies when they don't exist, create the chain of reaction, and arrive at a conclusion. And then we can determine whether or not something should be done or something should not be done. So once you know who the lecturer is, then whether or not they arrive late doesn't really matter. Because you know the lecturer, you know the subject matter, they can deduce that, solves the problem for you completely. You already know what instructor is going to be late. So. You can represent it in this terms down here where R and L are conditionally independent given M. So given M, we know that uh, we have a lecture, so, which is also noted by uh, the diagram here with the, uh, the circles. So conditional independence here is basically, this is a bigger picture of what you saw on the previous slide here, looking at the teacher with the subject matter and the other teacher up there, and look, looking at, we can write down the probability of M. So we take and we write out graphically the probability of each one of them. We connect the probabilities together. 
because this probability might have a condition that is associated that creates a dependence on another probability. We graph it all out. We traverse the diagram and we follow the paths. And it's just about reading a diagram at this point. And then we get our conclusion. We get the information that we're looking for. So I'm not going to bore you with all of the syntax for the diagram because you don't have to write one of these out. Um, if you wanted to, however, you could go through here and see how we're going to write out a Bayes network. And you can see it, actually. You're going to write one similar to it, actually, in the midterm if you choose to take, if you choose to complete that option. So, so if we assume we have five variables, and here's the problem solution, actually, um, in which we have uh, Marianne, who's a, Miriam, who's a, leads a tutorial. The tutorial leader arrives late. The tutorial concerns with reasoning with Bayes. It's sunny out. The tutorial starts at 1015. So we know all of the com conditions, so we can represent them in terms of the probabilities of each one of the conditions. And then we can make a Bayes network out of it. And so we have all the nodes. So the idea is to connect the nodes together in a logical order. So step number one is add the variables. So we've got the variables. So we just choose the variables that we'd uh, like to include in the network. Also keep in mind, we don't want to put irrelevant information in there. We, can, we don't have to put the data for the, the weather conditions over the last two weeks. We know it's sunny, so we can exclude out all the irrelevant information. We connect the dots. So we put the data out. Oops. Connect the dots in terms of the arrows for the conditions. So step two is add the links. So the link structures must be, um, well, we don't want to have cycles in here. We want to have to go down one to another, and we want it to, to read in a silic type fashion. So if node X is given parents Q1 and Q2 and Qn, then we are promising that the, any variable that's a non-descendant of X is conditionally independent of X in terms of the styling. And then we continue on with step number three to add the probability tables. So we come up with a probability table at each one of the nodes. So we can make a decision on each one of the nodes, as an example here, which way to go. So they're called weights, actually. So we add probability tables that turn into weights. The weights are going to make this. They're going to make the graph lean in a certain direction because you want to look for the heavier weight. Heavier weight is the higher likelihood that the event's going to occur. So here we have the table X, in which we have uh, parent values that are possible combinations of the parent value values that are shown, and we have uh, this kind of junction in which they both come together, and we can basically look at the truth tables for each one of them. So two unconnected variables here are still, may still be connected. So we have two, two unconnected ones. So not everything has a connection. So we look at the non-connected ones. Each node is conditionally independent on all of the non-descendants of the tree, given its parents. So you can deduce that any other condition independence related to the Bayes network might exist if you start looking at the other connections. So. In terms of the formalization, it's a network that's called a belief. So the Bayes network is actually referred to as a belief network. Because if you think about the concept, we're believing a certain event's going to occur. So if you go up to a red light, you know, you, you're coming up to the yellow light and you believe it's not going to turn red. Or you believe the instructor who's late is going to be Marianne or something. So it's often referred to as a belief network. And it's an argument of the directed graphs itself, represented by pairs of vertices. So you can represent it in a graph itself, or just list out a table of the vertices and a table of the paths. And then you can actually use um, you know, a computer program to essentially read it and evaluate it. So the probability distribution table itself, also called the conditional probability table, is what's used for each one of the nodes. It indicates the probability of the variables and the values depending upon the possible combinations of the parental values that are leading to it. So we have some key definitions that come out of it, and it's actually listed in the textbook. So one of the later chapters gets in the Bayes networks, which is not required reading, but you might find it interesting if you want to apply it towards anything. Um, so anyway. Um, they're basically families of different Bayes networks as well, and there's different types. This is the generic form of the Bayes network. Not everything there is about Bayes networks. This is just one example. So, um, The rest of this lecture, which I'm not going to go through, actually, um, goes through because this is a pretty long lecture, actually, and it's pretty tedious. 
So it goes through the process, and if you have an interest, I'm showing this to you because you might want to look at it, in terms of understanding and how to actually build it. You have to choose relative variables. You have to choose var relative conditions or non-conditional dependence or independence. You set out, out a plan of connecting them together. The key to the success of this is actually coming out with the correct truth tables. If your truth tables are incorrect, your answer is going to be incorrect because it's going to steer your weights in the wrong direction. So here we have this burglar alarm example that's in here. And as another example, showing you how to calculate the weights. And the reason why um, you want to kind of consider the design of this is because if you're using weights, you can evenly distribute the values to equal 100% of the problem environment. Or you can use different theories. This is just one approach to doing it. So a burglar here can set the alarm off. An earthquake can set the alarm off. The alarm can be cause, uh, can cause Mary to call. The alarm can cause John to call, because there's two people, Mary and John, living at this house. And the alarm goes off. So you're going to figure out, well, what's the likelihood of there being a burglar? So actually, most people would, would use another technique for this, actually. You could use, you know, and what's the likelihood that John's going to call versus Mary calling? So you have to consider, well, who's going to be awake? Who's going to be asleep? What alarm went off? Was there an earthquake? If there was an earthquake, then probably there's not a, probably not going to be a burglar. Was it a false alarm? So the number of table entries in here can be added up and can be used in terms of the factor of the weights. And you can also use that in terms of um, analysis as you're going through the network. Because the likelihood of there being an alarm is actually another factor as well. So suppose we choose the ordering here of Mary calls, John calls, and then we add Mary and John with the alarm, and we put the alarm factor in there, and then we add the burglar, the likelihood of there being a burglar versus a earthquake, and we're trying to figure out, well, what's the likelihood that someone's, not someone, but either John or Mary is going to call? We can kind of figure out, depending upon whether it's an earthquake or whether it's a burglary, who's going to call. And we can kind of statistically figure this out. And the network is less compact if we rearrange it. So here's another rearranging of the numbers. And what we're trying to do is kind of equate it from a particular weight perspective to come out with a certain value and associate that value with a, with a probability of the event actually occurring. Um, so you can read through this and see how you can mathematically, and actually not some really math, it's more like graph drawing, um, put it out in terms of the, of the problem constraint. So the rest of this lecture gets into confusing, you know, the differences between an independent and a dependent conditional relationship, the confusion that exists between the relationships, looking at a better design for reformatting it, and looking at in terms of the issues of the burglar network, pointing out all of the different scenarios and then adding factors and that might actually play effect. So here's a revisiting uh, different ways of doing it. Um, looking at dependent separation, de deseparation, um, where you're going to have the conditional independence between the variables in the network where there exists a deseparation, which is another component of the system. That if you were actually going to build a Bayes network, you probably want to consider this as well. Um, because it's going to play a factor in the evidence and the data that's being put together. So what does it mean um, to be blocked in a particular case? So something that might be blocked, something might be uh, missing, something might not be connected. So blocking diagrams, and then different diagram notation can actually be used as well. So I'm not going to go through deseparation, nor am I going to provide an example of it. I'm just going to essentially skip to the summary here because you guys want to know about Bayes networks, but you don't want to know about building them necessarily. But it's not a bad idea to be familiar with the concept because then it gives you an option to explore. The syntax for the network and the drawing of the tree is going to be dependent on the software that you're using, which is why I didn't go through all the syntax for it. Um, in theory, if you were building a Bayes network by scratch, you'd have to be concerned with how am I going to position the nodes and what am I going to do? Most of you, if you're ever going to apply this, what you're going to do is pick up a program that works with Bayes networks. There's a tons of shareware programs or open source programs out there where you plug in the information and it creates a Bayes network for you. And you have to give it the truth tables and the connections. And sometimes you actually can do this graphically where you drag lines between components and you make the connections. If you've ever configured a router, Cisco router, if you've ever configured network equipment, 
usually they have something very similar to a Bayes network, where this is dependent on this and that's dependent on that. You're making connections between the components and you're, you're basically turning on and off features to do intelligent routing, to do non-intelligent routing, to do fixed routing, assign this, to assign that. And what you're doing is you're connecting a phase network similarity where actually some of the stuff does st statistics for you. It says the probability of there being congestion is going to be too high. So this configuration is not optimal because you have all your traffic going this way. And you have five routers, but everything's going this way. You know, because of the way, and so the software actually is pretty intelligent these days. You can run analysis on there to tell you how fast you're going to get, I mean, what kind of average speed is your user is going to have, have you, meet, have you met capacity, are you over capacity, what connections are the weakest points, how to better design it. Some of them actually do it for you. Just do auto config. You know, it comes through and it sets all the settings to optimize the network. And it is a network, a physical network, by the way, but it resembles sort of a Bayes sort of um, scenario using probabilities and weights on each one of the nodes so that you can sort of predict problems and prevent them. So we now know what Bayes networks look like and how they determine which variables are in a conditional independence. He's also seen in this particular lecture how Bayes networks make inter inter inferences, excuse me, inferences to determine the probability of a break-in, or that Mary's going to call, or John's going to call, or that Mary Ann's going to show up late, or because she's shown up late because it was raining and she got into an accident versus not getting into an accident. So, and we've also seen however, that the Bayesian networks are more or less compact. Their small networks are not huge ones either. They make them faster for deriving conclusions. Bayes networks differ from other types of inference networks because. They're not showing everything. They're only showing the conditions and the chain reaction. Outside of going back to the traveling salesperson problem we looked at earlier with a search tree, and we applied a genetic kind of sort of algorithm approach to it, with the search tree, it was huge. Not an efficient solution. Phase networks don't have that problem because it will never be huge. It's not showing everything in the possible environment. It's only showing the connections, the only possible ways that something could possibly be derived. So you basically reduce the search space down into something more manageable, and you make more intelligent decisions, which is why people take this route versus traditional um, computer science trees and building trees of, you know, different types associated with, you know, depth first and breadth first and all of the other different types of searching, which is kind of slow and inefficient. So Bayes Network provides a more efficient foundation for this. And it means that inferences can still be time consuming. They may also be time consuming and space consuming. It doesn't necessarily mean because you're producing a Bayes Network that you're actually going to have an efficient solution to the problem. So correlation may not exist. So. That is everything you ever wanted to know about, well, not, maybe not everything. It's just a su summary or an overview of the concept of Bayes networks as it applies towards artificial intelligence. I'm going to stop the video and talk about routine class stuff now.